If something is able to go in the black hole... Black holes, their gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. You will be able to look out. What you will see is the universe accelerate and you will be able to witness the end of the universe. Today we are talking about space for dummies. I have here Konstantin Badigi. Is this right? That's uh, pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> okay, I'm the dummy here. And <laughs> right here. so <laughs> so tell me, uh, so we have eight planets in our solar system? Well, uh, you know, there's some there's some evidence that we might have a little more, but we have eight that we know are there for sure, right? We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, right? That's the inner or rocky, you know, small planets, the so-called terrestrial planets. Then you, as you go further out, the distances get wider. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay, and beyond Neptune is a field of icy debris called the Kuiper Belt. And I think... Wait, 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 yeah, wait. Before ahead. you go into that, I have a question. I, I saw uh, everyone sees the graph now on the screen. Is there is a reason why the smaller planets are closer to the sun and the bigger planets are further away? Yes, yes, there is. And, uh, and you know, frankly, it's complicated. Okay. Uh, the... <laughs> Um, I won't stop there. Uh, so, you know, formation of the solar system is one of these problems that is so, it's so, it's so easy to ask, right? Like, how did the solar system form? We see structure, we, you know, we see one type of planets close in, another type of planets further out. Surely it must be relatively simple, but actually it's a problem that we still actively continue to work on. There are a lot of different models that are competing. I... Uh, my collaborators and I have our own view of this, and it's you know it might be uh, you know it might at least partially be right. But at the end of the day, right, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing topic of research. So what we think happened is that the solar system had two distinct reservoirs of solid material when it was forming, basically a ring of rocky stuff close to where the earth is today and a ring of icy, you know, much more massive ring of icy debris kind of where Jupiter is today, about five times further away from the sun. And that gave birth in effect to two different populations of planets, the low mass planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then so the more massive they ones broke, further out. You are, they broke these things that you are talking about, right? Or it was one whole thing? No, no, it was like a ring of debris you can imagine like um you know like a disc of of rocks that are each about say 100 kilometers you know size of la um type of um building blocks and then over time you know they collide right they accrete dust and then they grow into planets okay that's maybe it is easy i mean i was talking about how complicated it is maybe it's all that's all of it so basically the reason is because it's, uh, I'm rephrasing to make sure that I understood. Really? It's because closer to the sun, it was different ring and uh, further yes. from the sun, it was different ring. So we have two, uh, so there is no, that nothing to do with heat. This is what came to my mind. It has to do with heat because closer to the sun, right? You cannot have water in ice form. Okay, and so this means that a, a large fraction of the budget, right, the original kind of budget of material that you have, the water can only condense, right, it can only turn into ice further away. That's part of the reason why the ice ring was more massive. Okay, and that's why kind of planets like Uranus and Neptune, and also of course Jupiter and Saturn, are much more massive than. Earth and, and Venus. Wow. So I was no, right. It's basically. not the full story, but it's it's it it's part of the answer. <laughs> okay. So can can you tell me some stuff specifically about each planet going from the like some basic information, what there yeah. is, why 
there is no life or if there is any specific life on planet going from the closest to yeah. the air, sun. Okay, so let's do a quick tour of the solar system. And I'll just point out a couple of interesting, maybe one or two interesting facts about each one, right? If you go away from the sun, the first planet you'll encounter is Mercury, okay? Now, Mercury, uh, what's interesting about it? It spins every three times that it orbits twice, okay? So for every two revolutions that it goes around the sun, it rotates exactly three times. And that has to, that's not a coincidence, that has to do with how tides cause Mercury to spin down and lock into a resonance, this this uh, ratio of, of periods. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. If you go further out, you will encounter Venus. Now Venus uh, so actually w- spins. Wait, yeah. I, oh, I, I'm I'm yeah. not sure if I understood what you said. So it spins three times and goes around the uh, sun three times uh, while twice. while there is twice while does the three spins and you said uh, for for what reason i didn't understand so the reason is that just like there are tides on the earth right that right what if you go tide to like means we we'll have some oh, tide, problem as well here yeah tide is like <laughs> you know go to the beach right not at the mediterranean but go to the beach at, at an ocean right um you will have water come closer you know uh every few hours and then recede every few hours and that's both because of the moon and the sun right so that uh that big gravitational the gravitational tug and the wave that comes and kind of washes onto the continents and away from continents, that's the tide. Now, the Earth, because of the tides raised on the Earth by the moon and the sun, is spinning down all the time, okay? So the day used to be shorter, okay? Like when the Earth formed, the day was maybe five hours. Now it's, of course, 24 hours, and it'll keep getting slower and slower. The same thing was happening on Mercury, it originally started spinning fast, okay, and wow, then wow, slowed wow, down. Wow, wow, this is yeah. this is crazy. Wow, keep going. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. This is this is good stuff, right? Like ties are ties are great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So Mercury is slowing down and down and down, and if it had a perfectly circular orbit, then just like our moon, it would spin down to such that it rotates exactly at the same rate as it goes around the star, right? If you ever wonder why is it that the moon is always facing the same sides to Earth, it's because of tides on the moon. They spun it down to a state where it's now always facing the same side, okay? But because Mercury so, has an oh, orbit... Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, keep going. Keep yeah. going. But because Mercury has an orbit that's that's really out of round, elliptical, right? Uh, as it turns out, there's another end state to that evolution that is stable, and that stability is where the spin period, right? The, the day on Mercury lasts 66 Earth days, while the orbit lasts 88 Earth days. So it's this remarkable you know, factor of 1.5. I'm, I'm not sure if I understood what you said. Okay, so uh, imagine, yeah, imagine a planet, it's I, spinning I fast. I told you in the beginning, this will be for dummies. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I, I mean, it's just like, yeah, you got a ball, it's spinning fast, right? Then imagine you slow it down, okay? Now, if you slow it down, okay, and it's in orbit that's perfectly circular, basically like our moon, then it will go to a state where as it rotates, it'll always face the same side to the body. Mm-hmm. This is why we always see the same side of the moon, never see the back side, right? But in the case of Mercury, because its orbit is rather out of round, okay, kind of elliptical, it spun down not to face the same side all the time, but it basically faces the same time Aside when it comes closest to the sun, okay, and it so turns out, okay, that a stable configuration, uh, that a stable resonance that emerges is one where it spins exactly one and a half times faster than it orbits. 
pretty cool, right? Okay. Yes, and I never knew the reason why the moon is. We never saw the side of the, the other side of the moon. So um, yeah, I, I have I have a question. So if we put uh, let's say to Mars the same uh, sea that we have in the in Earth, exactly the same, it will still spin the same the same time around the air around itself and around the sun or no you're talking about mars now specifically yes mm. or any yeah. planet if we have uh, the same uh it, w- it was the same planet like earth but it, it well, different okay. distance yeah so this is actually what you're asking about maybe is specifically the question of venus Venus used to have an ocean like the Earth, we think, right? When it just formed, in fact, probably was very uh, similar conditions, right? Pretty habitable. And then because it was closer to the, uh, the sun, the oceans evaporated, okay? And so now Venus is very in very bad place to live, right? It's huge pressure, uh, 90 times that of earth's pressure but importantly because of the thick atmosphere on venus and now something called the atmospheric tide which is more complicated than the usual tide the venus now spins uh, upside down very slowly so if about about the pressure that we have let's say i go to to venus and so am i going to be I'm going to be a lot shorter, right? If I stay there for a lot of years because of the 90 <laughs> times pressure, right? Well, I mean, Is this you'll correct? just get crushed. Yeah, you, you'll be, you'll get crushed by the pressure. Also, because the pressure is so high, the temperature is also so high, right? So it's kind of like, imagine taking a ball of gas, right? And then squeezing it, right? You intuitively know the temperature is going to go up. So the-, uh, the like, few- like we have- like we're steaming things inside a yes uh, a, like a pressure cooker right and so yes. the uh you know russian or rather soviet you know spacecraft that landed on the surface of venus in the 80s called Venera, they uh they were built like submarines okay but they were able to only last a couple hours on the surface of, of venus so it's not an and awesome place crashed to well, they, they actually, their problem, I only re- learned this recently, but the, the reason they burned up from the inside is not so much because they got crushed by the pressure, it's because they had electronics inside that were producing heat, and there was no way to expel the heat, okay, because the outside is also so hot, right? So they basically it burned from the inside. So if you build a machine <laughs> that can... Uh take out the heat and stay cool inside it can live in venus well for longer longer than two hours at least <laughs> <laughs> okay so for what the reasons all the planets are mostly inhabitable except than uh, heat and so um, it's hidden pressure. Is hidden pressure the only problem with the... So, look, the honest answer is that we don't really know for sure, okay? Like, nobody has been able to understand exactly how life emerges, right? We just don't know. But we think that water is uh, the key, right? Like, the existence of liquid water on the surface of the planet is a requirement. It's not doesn't mean that every water rich planet will necessarily have life, but we think that it's it's a necessary but insufficient condition. So then it doesn't matter re- it doesn't matter to be salt water or good water, just water. Well or- uh, if your water is too salty, things die, right? So like Mars has extremely salty water, but nothing survives in salty water. This is why you know, you make pickles in salty water, right? To kill all the bacteria and then last forever. So, um, 
So we think, you know, to some extent, fresh water, right? The existence of fresh water on the surface is a must. And that already tells you that the range where you can put a planet and have it be habitable is relatively limited, right? You put something far, far away, you know, a hundred times more distant than the earth on distance, right? All the water is going to freeze. You're going to have no life. You put it too close, all the water evaporates. So it's kind of a region. Uh, people like to call it the Goldilocks zone for the, you know, analogy with the story of things being not too hot, not too cold, you know, just right. And uh, that's a partial answer, I think, to to what you're asking. Um, but let me a- ask you this, okay? So the satellites of Jupiter, Okay, like there's one called Europa, which is the second big one. It's got a huge ocean underneath the surface. Okay, so the surface is water, uh, is is ice. But then if you go down, you know, uh, you know kilometers below, it's a water uh, ocean. Do you think there's life in it? Is it uh, ice? It's water. It's salty water. Salty water. Yeah, uh, salty ocean, just like you I, know, I, the Earth's oceans. I assume there is life to it. Something, yeah. bacteria or something. Could be. So, yeah. do you know? Be cool, right? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm asking you. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're just doing a guessing game right here. It's like... Uh, There is so many planets and stuff to explore that our resources are and our stuff that we're doing are very limited. So we're basically doing a lot of guessing game in this uh, part, right? Well, it's it's a guessing game, you know, that's constrained by physics and chemistry and biology. You can't just guess random stuff, right? Whatever guess, whatever hypothesis you put together better not violate any laws of physics and it also better not be such a convoluted explanation that it's completely unlikely but you know i think the question of where life exists in the universe is one um where the kind of sharper variant of that question is not so much does it exist elsewhere other than earth it seems to me statistically impossible that life does not exist anywhere else other than Earth, right? We know today of thousands of extrasolar planets, like planet formation happens around virtually every, you know, sun-like star. So I think the sharper question is like, where is the closest life? Is it on Europa? Is it maybe on Mars? Actually, right, if you kind of bury deep within, uh, you know, tens of centimeters below the surface is it bacterial life living in the like on the planet itself is it in the oceans of europa or do is life such a rare event that you have to travel i don't know halfway across the galaxy to encounter the first planet that has life? that's a question we just don't know the answer to and how can we start finding the answer how how can we get closer to the answer or closer to a better question to find the answer yeah so the in the your opinion basically yeah uh so the mars question is being addressed uh in the following way right now there is a rover on mars that's collecting samples okay it's collect the collecting samples for return to earth then NASA is going to do a very, very crazy set of, uh, you know, set of maneuvers where the next uh, spacecraft is going to come, going to drop the rover, rover is going to pick up the samples, put them on a rocket in Mars, the rocket's going to go back into Mars orbit, then get caught up with another, you know, like orbiting spacecraft, and that's going to take it back to Earth. It's a very, very crazy. Uh, so it you know, needs three... Two, two, three, three rockets. Three at least. Okay. It's <laughs> like you know, when it comes to rockets, I think you know, better have it and not need it, right? Than need it and not have it, right? So, uh, <laughs> look, you know, it's just like 
uh, it's this crazy thing, but you know, the, uh, there's going to be, there's going to be sample return in the future. Okay. We're going to get samples directly from Mars. Uh, what will that tell us? We, I don't obviously know yet because I haven't looked at them. And in any case, uh, you know, it'll be a lot of research, but you know, you can imagine one scenario where you bring the, them back and then you look and, and there's fossilized bacteria, right? Uh, that you, you see that you immediately know life at least emerged on Mars. Cause you know, on earth, some of the earliest signs of life that you can find is in a rock called stromatolite. So this rock, you know, you pick it up, you, you probably have seen these rocks where it looks like there's lines going through them. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, like those rocks uh, that you can find um, uh, relatively commonly on Earth, those rocks are fossilized bacteria from, you know, a billion years ago. So that would be one sure example of there being life on another planet. Uh, we're sending a lot of missions also in this decade to the satellites of Jupiter. Okay? So Europa is getting the Europa Clipper mission. Ganymede, which is the third satellite uh, of Jupiter, is getting the JUICE mission. So there'll be kind of all of this stuff going on. And then for planets around other stars, you can't send spacecraft there because it's too far and it'll take too long to get there. But what you can do is look for biosignatures. And the simplest biosignature you can look for is oxygen. Right? On Earth, oxygen, if, if all life was extinguished on Earth, uh, oxygen would go away pretty rapidly from the atmosphere. So any plants have oxygen in our solar system? There's like tiny, tiny amounts of oxygen in Jupiter and Saturn, atmosphere, but, but nothing like, you know, the 22% or whatever it is on the Earth in the Earth's atmosphere. Like the, the significant existence of oxygen is you know, a smoking gun, if you will, for the existence of life. Like if you didn't know the earth had life, but you knew the laws of physics and had a pretty good understanding of biochemistry and you detected spectroscopically that the earth uh, had such an abundant oxygen budget in the atmosphere, you would suspect uh, with a pretty high confidence that the earth was teeming with life. Can I make the most stupid decision ever made? Probably in this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Jim, that, what, that's, that sounds like it's up to you. <laughs> so <laughs> can the law of physics change in a different galaxy or in a different planet be slightly different? We think no. So uh, there are. So it's not a stupid question at all, actually. And one of the underlying, I would say, axioms of all cosmology is that the laws that of physics that we have here are the same laws that we have over there somewhere far away. See, if that's not true, you can't really do science, right? Because you could always say, well, the reason that you see something very different is because the laws of physics are different and, you know, who knows. But we can do... You know, and, and people have done, you know, kind of pretty direct uh, observational tests to ask that question. And the laws of physics appear to be the same everywhere. Now, there is a, um, a subgroup of people who question whether the fundamental constants, like the gravitational constant or the speed of light, you know, all these things change in time. And that used to be kind of a fringe... Um, you know, fringe discussion topic. I think it's becoming less fringe now. Um, it's, but that's that's as, but about as much variation in the laws of physics that I would be comfortable with. Okay, so you're saying if the time and light is is, dif is different or is doesn't have there or something might change things. Yeah, well, so, you know, of course, the universe is expanding, right? The universe is changing. It's not staying constant. So you could make the, you could ask the question, 
Or is the speed of light, for example, changing along with the universe itself? There's no evidence right now that it is, to be clear, right? I, I'm just saying that that's one interesting question you could ask and you could then design what, tests. What, what, if it, what if it does? So if it does, then the that would have important implications for how, for example, galaxies form, right? Because speed of light, okay, sets the speed limit for all communication in nature, okay? If I take, you know, if you, imagine you're able to measure the gravitational field of this pen, okay? Not oh, you right, have you pens your, there as well? Wow. I got everything. No, I got everything. <laughs> like, they treat me good around here. I got pens. <laughs> I got this, I don't know. I got staircase behind me. You got everything. All right, so <laughs> imagine that you try to measure the gravitational field of this pen. Uh, and I shake it like this, and you've got your eyes closed, but you have some detector. Uh, the that signal is going to travel from my pen to you at the speed of light. Okay. If you tried to see this pen, right, the f- you would see light reflected off of this pen traveling to you at the speed of light. The speed of light sets the speed limit for all dynamics of the solar system. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, just you know everything in nature so if that were so to change, the speed the yeah. speed the speed of life is how information travels basically correct correct yeah speed okay. of light is the fastest that information can travel that's why you know real estate next to the new york stock exchange is so expensive right because if you the closer you put your servers to the stock exchange the faster you can make decisions on high frequency trading Okay, first time I hear okay. this in my whole life. <laughs> now it's like between now, it's like step one, you know this. Step three, profit. <laughs> <laughs> and step four, splitting the profit. What's the percentage you want? <laughs> uh, should, we'll discuss that after. You know, we'll discuss that. Discuss that <laughs> offline. Yeah. Uh, okay. Continue yeah. about the. Let's say if there is a speed of life changes. Oh, I don't what know. What does man. that I mean? Haven't, I haven't thought about this that much. You know, like yeah. Well, look. I mean, I think that it'll <laughs> it'll you know probably have uh, implications for the um, like masses and sizes of the first galaxies. Right, that's about that's where I would go. But this is just guesswork. I'm I'm merely okay. answering your question of you know could the laws of physics be different? Could they evolve in space and in time? And I think they can't evolve in space, and they can't evolve in time either, except for maybe some of the constants, some of the kind of things we take as the basic you know units of of our world, those might change, but there's no evidence that they do. Okay, uh, going back to you said uh, hey, Venus, you? if I'm correct, had yeah. uh, uh, oceans, but they evaporated. Oh, so, okay. for how long, let's say that we had a window, maybe life was well, going to be know, able to to live there. For I don't, I don't remember the exact number. I think it was a hundred million years, you know, something maybe hundreds of millions of years. But yeah, it's it's less than a billion. It's le- less than a billion so, and more than a million. Yeah. Astrophysics, <laughs> you don't have to be that precise. You just say, but it's a million and billion somewhere in between. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. So let, but maybe a lot of plants have the right conditions for some time yeah. but they don't mm-hmm. have the right conditions for a long period of time for evolutions to evolution yeah. to do the game so yeah. that might be a big part of why we don't have life correct i mean look um let's go back to the you know analogy with the goldilocks right of things being not too hot not too cold actually built into that story is the uh, timing event of, you know, the girl coming into this, 
you know, house with the three bears at the exact time when one of the like bowls of porridge is at the right temperature. You can imagine the girl coming into the, you know, thing 10,000 years later during an ice age and then nothing, nothing is edible, right? So, uh, absolutely time plays a huge role. And maybe this, the reason the earth is so special is because the earth has been habitable as far as we can tell for, you know, nearly as long as the planet has existed. But I'm glad you also brought up the evolutionary game because for the first three billion year, uh, four maybe billion years of the earth's existence, it's a very boring life, right? It's just bacterial maps and, uh, you know, nothing, not much going on, right? I mean, the great oxygenation event uh, when oxygen started and sort of life, you know, exploded was a relatively recent event. So you can imagine a scenario where life is everywhere, but it's very boring. And there's no, like no interesting aliens, just like bacterial sludge. It'd be so disappointing. You know, still disappointed at the performance of other planets. Okay, they both get an F on the exam. Yes, because they don't have a beautiful person like me standing there. Well, that's one reason. <laughs> yes, but so you are saying that it's pretty boring to have only bacteria on a planet. I think so. I mean, it's. Is it uh, what's what would be more interesting, uh, a planet with bacteria, or a planet with cool geology but no bacteria? Which would you prefer? Mm, that to be able to think <laughs> in which one is probably the makes uh, <laughs> the being able to, so to. Being 50-50 on this question is uh, makes bacteria not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want like a planet with... Uh, yeah, I think I want a planet with no bacteria and no geology. Just perfect sphere. That's all I want. And we never saw anything like that. No, no. This is like um, this is what people used to think planets were like before Galileo Galilei, and uh, of course, planets are very planetary surfaces are very very rich, rich and beautiful and remarkable. Physics, yeah. Now, now that you brought this up, I'm curious to see: is there is like Everest, like uh, the mountain Everest? In other uh, plans as well, or are they more like a plain thing and maybe some oh. variations? No, I mean, on Mars, there's Olympus Mond, which I think is taller than Everest. I don't remember for sure, but yeah, um, there is amazing geology throughout the solar system. Okay. Even Pluto, which is not a planet, but, you know, kind of a you know big object-ish Right, big astro, big for an asteroid kind of thing. Uh, if you look at its surface, and you forget that what you're looking at is a lot of kind of nitrogen ice, um, then it looks a lot like Colorado, right? Beautiful mountains uh, that that are kind of very chiseled. So a lot of the same, you know, geological processes will recreate themselves at different scales and at different temperatures because, you know, you might, for example, again, going back to Pluto, like you will be in a situation where it's too cold for water ice to flow, but it's not too cold for nitrogen ice or, you know, CO ice to so, flow. So, so, so we see say, similar patterns during uh, to all the plat uh, planets about the shape uh, stuff because they are in similar yes. conditions being in the same solar system do you, th do you think that or because th this is how physics work 
Yeah, it's not because they have similar conditions. They have different conditions. But physics works oftentimes in a way where it'll kind of recreate the same phenomena or phenomena that look similar, you know, at different scales and at different under different conditions. Like a simple example is if you go hiking, right? You might stumble upon a creek, right, where water falls off of you know, a, a little, you know, rock this tall. But if you look at how it does that, right, it looks, you know, and, and you kind of take a close up picture, a lot of it looks like the Niagara Falls, right? So like a huge waterfall, you know, will kind of look similar. And that's, that's one example where, you know, you have scale invariance and the same kind of physical patterns will recreate themselves. Or take a satellite system of Jupiter, right? Like this is a small, small scale little planetary system, um, right? With Jupiter at, taking the role of the sun and the satellites taking the role of the planets. But no humans. Not that I've seen. I haven't checked. <laughs> you haven't personally checked. <laughs> yeah, I haven't personally checked. That's right. You're not going to find out until May you try. So uh, I, I want to talk about a, a, a lot of stuff because I, like w how we go, what's the right way to go out there and search for for life. Or uh, also you are very famously talking about the ninth planet, which I, I you, we started in the beginning. We, we went mm -hmm. to different areas. Let, let's start with that and then we go to the vast uh, consciousness and where we can find life all right that sounds that sounds like a plan we'll start with planet nine step two consciousness step three profit that's what we're talking about right as we were to <laughs> reference the earlier <laughs> yes. speed of life profit conversation yes. pro 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 profit from space is so interesting <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's interesting too, um, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. So look, uh, Planet Nine, right? So you, what is you it? are a good yeah. you you are a good YouTuber because you are hyping Me? things for later. Yes. <laughs> I uh, yeah I don't know. I'm definitely yeah not a good YouTuber, um, but um, you know look so in the solar system right we started off this conversation with how many planets there are in the solar system and we got to sort of neptune and it said beyond neptune there's this field of icy debris right this basically a second asteroid belt where it's out of icy asteroids floating around beyond neptune and if you go and look at the most distant orbits of these um, icy asteroids it looks like they're being gravitationally tugged into confinement. They're all kind of pointing in the same direction. And that and a few other lines of reasoning uh, is why I and uh, some others believe the solar system hosts an additional planet uh, much further beyond the orbit of Neptune. Can you explain me the conditions that something need to have to be able to be called a planet uh so yes although these this is not a this is not a great set of conditions okay i'll give you first i'll give you the conditions the so the international astronomical union has these rules about what you have to have to call something a planet and that is number one it has to orbit the sun uh number two it has to be spherical right so it has to have enough mass to become a ball to a good approximation and um thirdly it has to clear out its own orbit okay and what does that mean that means that its gravity has to be so strong that it commands its own orbital neighborhood rather than being just one of many kind of rocks floating around so as we talked about just some tens of minutes ago about, you know, kind of a disc of debris, disc of kind of 100 kilometer rock floating around, colliding into each other, right? Are those planets, are those individual objects planets? No, because they haven't cleared out their neighborhood. But once they coalesce, 
into something like the Earth, for example, then it becomes a planet according to this definition. How something clears out the neighborhood? With gravity. So, so in because the solar system, yeah, yeah, continue. yeah. It, I mean, there's only there's four fundamental forces in uh, nature, right? It's gravity, electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force, and at the scale of the solar system, right? The only thing you have to really worry about is gravity, right? If you're talking about the dynamics of the solar, system, the orbits, and and things like that. Uh, now, of course. As you zoom in, you have to worry about all this other stuff. But, you know, gravity is the main player at large scales. So if something has strong gravity, it means that it will pull stuff to it. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, and for example, Earth is pulling the moon, right? To yes, it. sure. So, uh, well, the Earth, so this the moon is going around. So it's not, the Earth is not going to eat the moon, but... Because the moon is in orbit. If the moon stopped orbiting the Earth, it would, of course, fall onto the Earth, and that would be bad. Uh, that'd be bad for everybody. Okay. Bad for the moon, too. Um, but because it's orbiting, it's always kind of in free fall, but it's never falling. Does mo the moon, this is a bit out of topic, but th does the moon get closer as years go, a bit further? Is it still the same distance? It's getting further at about a centimeter per year. Okay. And that's because of tides. So you have to enjoy the moon while it's close. Right? Because if you wait long enough, it'll just be further out. Actually, this is a... Not uh, in our lifetime. A, <laughs> yeah, in our lifetime, I think we're okay. But the <laughs> question of, you know, solar eclipses, right? Like, you know, the solar eclipse happens because the moon comes in and, you know, blocks out the sun, right? Eventually, the moon will move far enough away that on the sky, it will appear smaller than the sun. So full solar eclipses will not be possible in the future. So full solar eclipses is something really special as well. Well, I mean, I think it's, it, we had one a few years ago, right? A bunch of people like went to see it and it's, it's a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you can kind of experience on earth. That is a real, um, there's a, you know, genuine consequence of sort of the machinery of of the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of the Moon, and, and I, I I feel like there's something visceral and really kind of amazing about it. But um, at the same time, it's a remarkable coincidence that right now the size of the Moon and the size of the Sun on the nights, or sorry, on the day sky, are almost exactly the same. Right, because the moon used to be closer, it used to be bigger on the on the sky. If we kind of keep the clock going in billions of years, it's going to be much smaller. But right now, the fact that the moon can perfectly eclipse the sun, right, where you can sort of still see the corona, but but you kind of they they appear exactly the same. That's a coincidence of this moment in, in the cosmic clock of the solar system. The fact that we evolved to be able to appreciate it now is kind of an interesting coincidence yes it's more <laughs> sexy than being with meeting a beautiful girl in the bar man uh i mean look the the eclipse it's just like it's the best <laughs> but, so can, can, can you so yeah. why we never spotted planet nine before and how we spot it is it uh, telescopes is it uh, spaceships traveling to it how we, we didn't spot it before uh because it's really far away right? and it's very very dim and one approach that we've been doing to try to find planet nine directly is to use a telescope now, it might actually be too dim for that as well. Uh, we're, we're learning the hard way that it's, it's very, very difficult to observe at that level of, 
um, at the right, we'll call it the right magnitude, right? To find some, something that dim um, and do that efficiently. The other idea is to try and find it gravitationally. So that there, the idea is to launch, you know, a few basically spaceships that talk to each other and know precisely where they are. And try to compute, try to try to detect the deviation of their orbit away from what's expected. That's that's an idea that uh, we've played around with together with some colleagues from JPL, and that's um, you know I think it's pretty promising, and it's a little crazy, but I think so it's pretty. So f- for for me to understand what you are talking about, so you mm-hmm. are going to put let's say in the Earth. Then planet nine, they're going to put just basically one uh, one spaceship or a satellite three in the middle, and uh, three spaceships and li- three spaceships them in yeah. th- across planet nine in yeah. the so they can communicate mm-hmm. and you can transfer yeah. information kind yeah. of faster than yeah. and a speed of not faster than a speed of light, but because it will divide by three. You're going to get it faster, right? But you don't have to go to planet nine. You just put these objects, you just put these three or more spacecraft in orbit around the sun. And the point is that you have to be able to measure their location very, very precisely to something like, you know, centimeters. Okay. It's not impossible. It's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And if you know exactly their locations for about a year, a little bit more than a year, then you can math perfectly... Will help, ma- ma- math will help us yeah. to measure their location precisely, right? This is done with maths. With math? Like mathematics? Yes. This is what will help uh, us, right? It will definitely not hurt. Yeah. Again, better have it not. <laughs> <laughs> you know... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you know, and if you're able to uh, measure the deviation, ever so, so slight deviations uh, of the tra- spacecraft trajectories, then there is a chance you might be able to directly determine the you know location of Planet Nine. And it's kind of like, I don't know, if you're imagine you're sitting on a beach, okay, in the Mediterranean. Uh, right, and you put three. Um, you know, you have three people that are that are kind of one is I don't know in Greece, another one's in France, and another one that uh, is in, in Cyprus. In Cyprus, sure, why not? Okay, and then uh, you kind of suspect that some there's a bit of flash somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean. Then you kind of wait for the wave to arrive. If each of those people is able to time, you know, report the exact time when the wave arrived to them. Then they're going to be able to use math to uh, kind of backtrack where the splash has been, right? Kind of figure out where the oh splash my, uh, is. This, what, this was a bit uh, complicated for my small brain. Can you explain again what, what they are going to measure and why they are measuring? Right? Okay, so let's let's do a simpler example. Let's do you and I are sitting at a lake. Okay, and we are uh, for some reason we believe that a meteorite is going to fall on a lake, uh, on this lake, right? But for some reason we can't see it because it's a big lake. Okay, now uh, what you and I do is we wait for a wave that's created by the meteorite hitting the lake to come to the shore. Okay, and I measure, you know, kind of just the time. You know, I record the time when the wave comes, and you record the time when the wave comes. Okay? From that difference, we'll be able to figure out the distance between us where the meteorite fell, because the wave travels at some speed across and, the lake. And that meteorite is planet nine, right? Definitely not. I'm just using that as an example uh, of, of how you can use timing to to figure out the but to figure what out you're going to me- what you're going to measure though 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm like maybe yeah. in the analogy, yeah, in the analogy, yes, that that meteorite oh. is like Planet Nine. It's the thing yes. that creates the deviation. Yes, I'm I'm sorry. I was I immediately imagined Planet Nine falling onto a lake, and it just that image scared me so much that I um, <laughs> immediately lost track of what we were talking about. So I apologize. <laughs> So how how yeah. big is Planet Nine? So we don't know for sure, but we think it's about five times the mass of the sun, of the, the Earth. And and is there is we don't know if we don't know how what's the ma what's what's the mass or whatever. Probably we don't know if there is life to it, right? <laughs> well, we we can pretty safely assume there's no life. Right, I mean, so because cool. it's much further than the the sun. That's right. Yeah, so there's unless something crazy is happening on. I don't know. I'm making this up, but like, if you has satellites or something, and one of the satellites, like Europa, uh, has a ocean that's tidally heated or whatever. Yeah, just like you can make up crazy <laughs> what, stories, but. What, What tidally heated means? Is that oh, so yeah, tides. As we we talked about tides earlier in the conversation, right? Okay. So tides yes. are a form of friction, and so they can heat up the interior of a planet or a satellite. Okay. Oh wow! So yeah, the satellite Io, satellite of Jupiter Io, right? <laughs> um, which is the most you know which has the most remarkable volcanism in all of the solar system right that volcano is going off like crazy that's entirely due to tidal friction inside io wow so another way to make yeah. heat is friction so if we have yeah. like uh make machines or stuff that are creating friction they can produce heat in uh, in the uh, planet so this is one of the methods that uh, uh elon musk is trying to do on mars as well uh because uh, yeah. he said that bomb the two poles of mars and yeah. it yeah. will uh, it it will yeah. Yeah, warm yeah. so uh, So that that idea how, is like real. Talk about all this, like how we can warm something up, or how we can create sufficient conditions in a planet. You know, uh, the the best way is to remember the Henry Ford quote that remember that chopping wood warms you twice. Okay, that's the best way. Okay, uh, so Have it you warms heard of this you. What? No. Yeah. Chopping <laughs> so wood warms, it warms you twice because you are getting uh, exactly. tired and you are getting warm, and then when you are in the fireplace. Exactly. Yeah. Chopping wood warms you twice. So how does know. that translate What? to to? Uh, Uh, planet sufficiency, please uh, help me. Uh, you know, so look, if you're on Mars and you're you're a little you're a little cold, and you're trying to think to yourself, man, how can I how can I solve this problem? The first thing that you should be thinking about is chopping wood warms you twice. Okay. Uh, now that's that's certainly one way. The um, actually, I like what you asked about you know, drawing energy from, from tides, which is a a real idea. So imagine you have a buoy, okay? Uh, and you put it on the ocean. And just because of the tide, the buoy will go up and down, right? As the tide comes in, tide comes out, right? That is a way to generate energy, right? You can generate electricity that way. That's a perfectly... It's not going to work on Mars because Mars doesn't have an ocean, right? But it can work on Earth, and f particularly for island nations or just like you know, 
islands where a lot of energy has to be imported, it actually is a pretty interesting um, thing to look into. Um, I think even Hawaii had some like DOE uh, lab that was working on this. Um, so anyway, ti- turning tidal no, energy into no, no, that that's very interesting. I I never saw. I saw while the river is is moving to have some stuff that mm-hmm. produce energy, but I never saw with the up and down of the sea creating energy. And because we have yeah. so much sea, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that's something worth looking into. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and also, uh, it's it's one of these things where, you know, ultimately you might say, okay, where is the energy actually coming from? Because there's no free lunch ever, right? You have to have a budget, right, of energy. And the answer is the energy then is coming from the orbit of the moon. Like the moon is the thing that's actually powering your device. And I think that oh. that's that's cool, right? The the moon and uh, the sun as well, right? Sure, and, sure, yeah. And yeah, all the, the planets probably is. have a, a, a small effect. All the other planets, uh, like, or or their their gravity is not strong enough to affect yeah. the ties. Exactly, their gravity is not strong. But the moon gravity, it is strong enough. Yeah, the moon is very close. And why the sun is able to affect the gravity? Because it's a huge object with a lot of gravity? Exactly. It's got a lot of mass. In fact, um, I signed this problem in my planetary physics class, but you can show with a pretty simple calculation that the amount of tide, the height of the tide that you will experience on the earth is given roughly by the size that something appears in the night sky. Okay, so if the, the density of the material is the same, then two things that have the same angular size in the sky will create the same tidal um, um, height. It's a problem by that. Okay, so you have to solve it. Okay. So, wait. Uh, so, depending on how much, how big we see the object, this is how much it will affect the ties? Yeah, because how the angular size of an object, right, something that's not very massive but close will appear big, or something very massive and huge but far away will also appear big. So, those two things actually cancel out in such a way that the angular size of an object uh, on the, you know, as we see it on the sky, will in fact determine how high the, the gravitational tide is. So what this means, and you can again demonstrate this to yourself, you know, with a little bit of math, uh, you know, this evening, is that, you know, you can say, I, you know, you have an eye, right, and the moon is raising a tide on your eye as well, and so is the sun. But if you take, you know, your thumb and block out the moon, then you can show that the gravity of your thumb is raising a tide on your eye, which is about as tall as the one raised by the moon and the sun. It's pretty cool. Uh, wait, the last thing that you said about, so the tide of your yeah, thumb so in your eye. Your thumb is not very massive, right? Your thumb is like four grams or something like that. Okay. Um, but if you put it up, you know, about like this, then the angular size of your thumb is just about big enough to block out the moon. Right? It's like the moon and the sun. So rough. Oh, so you so that, you are not going to have tie. If you blo- if you put a block between uh, the moon and uh, no, no, no. a wall, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you know, just like the moon uh, raises a tide on the Earth, it also raises a tide on your eye. Right? There's a difference in gravity on on the front and the back side of your eye. Okay. Okay. So there's a tiny tide on the surface of your eye due to the 
uh, wow. sun wow. and Jupiter and the moon. Okay. And so the question that because you know we're talking about the angular distance or how big things have to appear, putting your thumb at at sort of a distance away from your eye such that it blocks out the moon and the sun uh, will give rise to about the same tide on your eye as the moon and the sun. Okay, I understand. I know. It's just like it's, it's, it's stupid things like this, <laughs> but you know, it's fun to it's like fun to occupy your mind with with useless information like this. No, it's interesting. Any information <laughs> is good information. So, uh let's let's go let's uh, go one step beyond our, our solar system and can you explain me with very visual stuff? Okay. This is the sun, this is the planets, and it's orbiting about, around the uh, galaxy. And then we have galaxies, uh, just for me for me and everyone to understand. Okay, so we've got, you know, the sun. Let's start with the sun, right? Um, then, as you go out, you've got the Earth. Of course, the Earth takes a year to go around the sun. Now, if you adopt as a length unit the distance between the Earth and the Sun, then um, you know you have as you go further out at five times that you have Jupiter, at ten times that you have Saturn, at twenty times that you have Uranus, at thirty you have Neptune, at something like seven hundred you have Planet Nine. Okay, and by the time you get to about a hundred thousand, you are you know, an appreciable, maybe a third of the way to the first star, uh, the first next star. Alpha. Uh, okay. So, wow. uh, Proxima Centauri is about, uh, I think, you know, something like 300 or 400,000 astronomical units away. Okay. And then you can imagine zooming out further than that. And then the locally, the stars look like, uh, you know, more or less billiards, right? Game of billiard. Like locally, they what, look like, uh, you know, yeah, they're just flying. They, yeah, billiards. Yeah. You know, how, like if you hit the billiards, like all the balls are kind of just moving randomly. It's the same thing as, you know, air in this room. The molecules are just kind of moving more or less randomly, occasionally colliding with one each, with one another. Now, stars, of course, don't collide with one another, but they, will kind of gravitationally change each other's orbits ever so slightly. Now, if you move out then further, then all of this... Why they don't collide? Why, why they don't collide? Because they're tiny, um, you know, at that scale. I mean, think about it this way. The distance between us and, you know, the, our, the closest star is you know, something like hundreds of thousands of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, right? But the Sun itself is a tiny fraction of that. So, there's a lot of empty space um, in between. So, that's why... Which is covered with what? Oh, it's covered with uh, interstellar medium. So, it's just like very, very diffuse gas. Um, just like a little bit of hydrogen and helium and like a few other things but mostly it's just completely diffuse gas okay and continue. uh yeah so then as Going you move out further. uh further right you find out that this local you know motion of stars is actually you know, kind of co-moving in a galaxy right and of course we've seen beautiful pictures of i think everybody has seen beautiful pictures of galaxies uh, and then if you zoom out further, it turns out that galaxies themselves are not alone. So, in our kind of local group, the two big galaxies are the Milky Way, where we live, right? And the other one is Andromeda. Andromeda, you can actually see if you go, you know, to like, you know, a particularly good night on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, for example, you don't need uh, binoculars to see it. You can just see it with the naked eye. And it's really cool. Um, and in about two billion years, Andromeda and the Milky Way will collide and create, you know, this 
bigger uh, galaxy. And there's also a bunch of little satellite galaxies that are also orbiting. Collide means us. that they are going to crash, or it means yes. that they are going to crash. In yeah, they're going to fuse together. Time? Two, two and a half billion years. Oh, wow. So we're fucked. No, no. It's going to be at when that happens, something like zero stars will collide with other stars. What do you mean? So well, it's not going to break uh, and crash. It's going to the two galaxies. If you look at the galaxies themselves, they will collide together. There will be this beautiful, you know, creation of spiral arms and it'll, it'll look like you know it, simulations of this really look magnificent but then you ask you know will any stars get affected by this and the answer is no you know just sort of be, and the be reason okay. because is no is because there is so much space between the stars that is unlikely for them to crash. That's the reason. Exactly. That's right. That's exactly right. In the middle of the galaxy, what we are going around, like in the example of we are going around the sun, in the galaxy, mm -hmm. what is the thing that we are going around? So in the center of the galaxy, uh, at the center of our galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole, uh, which is about 4 million solar masses. Okay, it's called Sagittarius A star. And um, it was unclear for a long time, but now it's looking, uh, it's sort of settled more or less that pretty much all big galaxies like the Milky Way or Andromeda have nuclei that have supermassive black holes in them. Okay. Now, the amazing thing is that if you go close to the black hole, when by close, I mean in the kind of nearest portion where there are stars, okay, you can actually track the motion of the stars themselves. And it takes kind of, you know, a decade or two for them to complete one revolution. So once again, you get to see almost, you know, almost planet-like dynamics but uh, you know unfolding on a much larger scale right we talked about scale and variance of physics earlier and this is another example where you will see kind of planet-like um, things unfold with this. the nucleus if you will is the supermassive black holes the stars themselves are of course each individual star right but it acts like a planet so if we go, so there is one black hole in the middle of our uh, ga galaxy, and the name of our galaxy is Milky Way, and uh, everything. So when we get close to it, what happens? We are crashing. Uh, if you get close to the black hole, right? Uh, what happens is spaghettification. Because black holes gravitification, you said exactly. Because black holes gravity is so strong that exert that it exerts a very strong tide, okay, which will elongate you and kind of makes everything look like spaghetti. So maybe we don't. If something is able to go in the black hole, yeah, do. What is there? There's no teleport, or there is not, no. We don't know what will happen, or something, right? Well, so look, I mean, black holes. The simplest way to understand them is that their gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. Okay, and that's why they appear black because no light can get out. Now, suppose you know you're falling into it, and you cross that event horizon. Okay, of where where light cannot get out. What will you see? Like, well, how will you notice it? And the answer is no. You will just kind of keep falling. But as you fall deeper and deeper, because of interesting ways in which time dilation. Well, well, well wait, wait, wait. You said before that uh, light is how the information travels. So if light is not able to go in there, so I'm not going to be able to sense. Or 
information. So, right? It can go I, in, I, but it cannot come out. Oh, okay. So I will still have information. Yeah, you will be able to look out and see the universe as you're hauling into the black hole. Um, and in, again, because of interesting ways in which time dilates and pr- presence of a very strong gravitational field, what you will see is the universe accelerate. Okay, so like, because time for you will pass ever so slowly and you will be able to sort of witness the end of the universe uh, as you fall into the black hole. Uh, But this is kind of getting into remarkable aspects of general relativity, which is super cool. Oh. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) My brain is going to explode. So if I'm going in the black hole, I will be able to see the universe and as you, if you look out like time for you as you go deeper and deeper into the black hole time for you is now running very slowly okay but and so in the rest of the universe by comparison right you get to see things accelerate and the deeper you fall into the black hole the bigger that differential in time will be um and so that's why you'll get to see kind of all of the, you know, provided you have a very good, tele- you're falling into the black hole together with a telescope and you're doing astronomy as you fall in, right? You'll be able to see amazing things. This is also so another if, way. No, yeah, go ahead. Another continue. way, like, for, for example, okay, imagine like you really want uh, to wa- binge watch a show, right? Or like you're waiting for some, like, album to come out but like you just i like, can't wait for it Dude, how do you make a time machine such that uh you know time passes faster the answer is is you have to create a very massive thing okay hollow make a you know make a hollow center okay have a telescope that is able to see it and then put a tv outside of it so that the tv is affected by the gravity of the thing but you are not okay because you're at the center this is a bit of a digression, and I apologize for that. But anyway, that's what came to mind uh, as we were talking, is that you know you can make a forward time machine if you have some way of creating a very strong gravitational field that affects something, the thing that you want to accelerate. So let's say if we're able to stay uh, or to teleport and not be crushed, become spaghettification, like you said, when we're closing the black hole, we're going to be able to live longer, right? No, your biological clock will not be affected by this at all. You will just live your life and age as you will. But the, you know, one day for you, even though it'll feel and elapse as one day for you for somebody outside of the black hole will be like a million years. So you'll be able to, it's kind of like watching the rest of the universe and fast forward, which is pretty cool. That's how I'm going to die. Okay. I'm going to the black hole. I want to see how the universe ends. This is your, your dream. Uh, this is my, this is my plan. So uh, I, I have uh, so we have Andromeda, Milky Way, and those are galaxies. And are they going around something? Are there? Uh, well, are no, they- they're they're kind of in their own local group. That's what the Andromeda and the Milky Way are kind of their own thing. Um, there's a bunch of other galaxies here and there. So all these galaxies are not going around something. No, no. The, well, as far as we know, there's not like a central, you know, giant, you know, anchor around which the galaxies like. Uh, Isn't it emoji. very logical to be something like that? We, but we didn't uh, discover it yet, or we don't have the They're tools all... to understand it. Not, no, not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. I mean, at, at the end of the day. 
right? Eventually, because of the speed of light, you do run out of scale, okay? And like, if you keep zooming out, eventually you go to a, um, a length so big that in the age of the universe, two, uh, you know, two points have not communicated, right? And so there's, you kind of run out of scale eventually. So this is the ga- a lot of galaxies further, 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 and they're just expanding. This is, uh, the space is expanding. Yes. So space itself is indeed space between galaxies is expanding and accelerating. Um, we call that dark energy and because it's a, it's some kind of a vacuum energy. We don't know what, where it comes from. We don't really know how it works. We can simulate it by putting a number into the Einstein field equations. Maybe that's, that's all it really is. But in short, this is one of the great mysteries, I would say, of cosmology today. Where does dark energy come from? So I don't know the answer. How, yeah. how I become a trillionaire from space? How, how do you become a trillionaire from space? Uh, how about this? You say that dark energy is also renewable energy. Okay. And, and solve the energy crisis that way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but... Uh, so uh, again step one that we do, do that step three profit we don't have dark energy in our uh, solar system right well as far as we understand it's all around us actually it just manifests on very large scales as as acceleration but as far as we know it's all around us. so there is here some dark energy yeah and there as well wow <laughs> look you know it, i don't know if you when it comes to your uh, plan on becoming a space trillionaire and uh you know if you had one shot one opportunity would you capture Is everything <laughs> everything you ever wanted you know just one moment <laughs> So, so no, that's that's actually a real question. There is uh, Elon Musk trying is p- trying to uh-huh. profit from space, and now he created new uh, Starlink, so he can shoot satellites and he can make uh, profit. So he can fund uh, uh, the starships, so that he can go to Mars. And this is actually uh, like. Uh, there is my asteroids mining. Peter da- Diamandis, I think, is uh, mm-hmm. associated with that. So I'm um, like, uh, and like also uh, say, um, uh, Jeff Bezos said that one of the best industries of the future is space stuff. Mm-hmm. So yep. I think there is a lot of money to be made. And wh- where do you see? this go how, how if yeah industries creating in around space well so you know i'm not a uh i'm not a space you know space economy vc but one interesting idea that you can sort of right away at least at the idea stage know is interesting is that of course the earth you know, has a lot of dirty manufacturing, right? And the environment is not like, I think, you know, environmental decay is something that we all are and should be concerned about. So you could, as a, as a thesis, imagine, you know, the moving the dirty industries to like the moon or to Mars or something and and have the earth, you know, not suffer the consequences of our manufacturing or, or do manufacturing in orbit, right? Like that's another idea. So, so absolutely. I think you're right. There's a, there's a remarkable amount of, uh, capital to be made in the space economy. So uh, can you explain me what you said? Because I'm not so go and manufacture stuff in space. This is what you're in Mars, yeah, let's say. That's right. Exactly. So take so, 
What does know, that but, but look? I make clothes in in Mars, like. Well, you know, I think clothes are not the dirtiest manufacturing, right? Like, imagine chemical. Like, imagine you're running some chemical plant, which is dumping a lot of waste into the environment, right? If you are able, that we to, don't want to do in the Earth because we don't want to pollute the Earth. Exactly. Yeah. But imagine you're able to do that on the moon. And I mean, there's no and life on the moon. Nuclear, a lot of crazy stuff. That even if they explode, we don't care or whatever. No, uh, at least you care less, uh, you know. And so yes. that could be one, <laughs> you know, one kind of a um, one approach to take. Now, of course, this is you have to remember you. You know, you'll always run into the practical problem of the energy cost that it takes to travel back and forth between the moon and the earth. So that's a that's a very non-trivial um, energy cost. So if you're able to solve that, then yeah, imagine like fusion becomes a reality tomorrow. Okay, like fusion and where and energy is practically free. Now, and imagine you're able to run you know, uh, spaceships on, on that energy, then you, it makes suddenly a lot of sense to move all dirty manufacturing to the moon. So it's such that you preserve our planet, right? Our to planet. The moon, the, you said not n- yeah, to, to the, the moon, moon. You said that I, yeah, I mean, or Mars, it's just moon is closer. <laughs> <laughs> when you start getting into these uh, uh, realms, is uh, because it's stuff that is not in our reality, it's like it messes with your brain to think about <laughs> this stuff. <laughs> but I think it's cool. I think it's it's totally. Um, you know, I don't think that there's a fundamental reason why this cannot be done. Right? All the reasons are practical, and usually when reasons are practical. Right, it's a matter of time before you know smart people figure it out. So this is no, what Elon Musk always, is but... saying is not is not violating the laws of physics. So uh, it's so... certainly not violating the laws of physics. No. So you yeah, think I mean, if, if we... someone mm-hmm. is able, for example, to starships to go back and forth and solve this not trivial problem that you're saying, so there is going to be so much innovation, so much because that's the barrier to uh, right. And then, yeah. So Usually what's when after trillionaire? Yeah. Uh, what's after trillionaire? I don't know. F- Four hundred qu- or qu- qu- <laughs> quadrillionaire? I don't know. Bazillionaire? Yes. I, I don't know. No. <laughs> so the person that will solve this problem probably will become a quasillionaire. Quite. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So I have $1 trillion and I give it to you now. So uh, how, how do you spend it uh, uh, in your lifetime? Like what is the projects that you're going to do? What you're passionate to do? Yeah. So look, I... um. You know, I live a pretty, pretty simple life. I only need like a billion. I don't need a trillion. Okay. So the remaining 999 billion, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll figure out, you know, how to, how to distribute broadly. No, look, so I think it's, uh, it's a, it's a question that I have not pondered because I don't have a trillion. Okay, but as far as projects that I personally want to get be involved in, okay, I'm already doing them, right? Like without a trillion dollars, I'm already doing astrophysics. And I absolutely love it. I'm already playing music, and I absolutely love it. And as far as like kind of what brings me joy, that's that's all that I need. Now, as far as issues that I'm concerned about, right? Like I worry quite a bit about you know the environment and not in sort of like the you know oh we should all go back to living 
you know, super simple lives. Like I think that there, there's, uh, we can innovate uh, out of the environmental crisis, but I, I like to, you know, travel a lot. I like to spend time in nature and I think that kind of environment is something I'm uh, passionate about. So if I was to, you know, consider where I would go, where I would put in capital, that would be one place that I would do it. And uh, do you have any idea how do you spend it there? Um, frankly, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, fr- frankly, I like the short answer is is no. Um, one interesting avenue for spending money that you don't know what to do with is to give it to research institutes that are doing good work, right? So what comes to mind, uh, right? Caltech got this humongous gift uh, of, I don't know how exactly how many hundreds of millions of dollars, but it was to, you know, to study sustainability, to study like, you know, climate, uh, you know, and all the science that accompanies it. And it's very enabling, right? These types of private gifts of that, um, they all come with kind of money that's that doesn't have as many kind of strings attached to it as the as federal money does. It can be quite transformative, and it can really change, you know, empower, you know, new type of research. And I think that that's you know that's a very kind of high efficiency mode of spending money. So giving to the research people that they do good work. Yeah, give it to people that are smart and passionate about solving some problem, right? And then, um, you know, kind of stir the pot and and let go. Oftentimes, from what I've seen, some of the best, uh, you know, research comes out of situations where you're given, you know, some resources. And then the person giving you the resources is not looking for a very clear plan of, you know, what is the, you know, step one through five of exactly what you will do and what will you accomplish along the way? It's just like, you know, take this, do follow your nose and do the thing that you think is going to make most sense because you are the expert in this and, and see what comes out. And that type of, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a book, uh, called the usefulness of useless information or useless knowledge. Um, and it ri- was written by um, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And, and in it, you know, something that he points out is that, uh, you know, when you kind of unshackle yourself from number fetishisms of exactly, you know, what are the, um, the milestones and exactly what is the kind of, uh, specific accomplishments here and there, you're able to do so much more, right? An example is like, take, um, you know, take research like, you know, figuring out electricity and magnetism, right? When Maxwell was writing down his set of equations which govern electricity and magnetism, he wasn't sitting around saying, well, hopefully one day somebody's going to use this to make an iPhone and make a lot of money, right? Like it was entirely just a passion project, right? It's just like all of this passion-driven, curiosity-driven research. Enabling that is some of the best things that a society can do, just like enabling art, right? Art and, you know, creation of music, all this stuff, it's useless on a day-to-day basis, right? No one is like, no one needs to consume it precisely or you know you, it's difficult to measure what comes out of it but at the same time you know i want to live in a society that invests a lot into these types of things right like art like like science like music right it's like it's the opposite of this sort of totalitarian very functional uh you know mindset so i don't know i'm going off on a rant now and so i'll stop no, uh, ve- very, 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 very beautifully said. And I have uh, a question 
to ask mm -hmm. about uh, what you said about the you are passionate about the environment, and I'm curious to hear to explain your concern because I hear a lot of people talking about this, and they're like, "We're dying. There is no problem." There is always in the middle and go closer to mm -hmm. say like, what do you see is the problem for me to understand what the problem with climate? Yeah. So I don't, I'm not a, like a climate alarmist, right? I don't think that, you know, in five years we're all going extinct or 10 years we're all going extinct or whatever. I'm also not on the side of the spectrum of people that say, man, it's fine. You know, it's just like we have uh, to, to, I guess, you know, summarize it in the most succinct way possible, right? In the last 200 years, right, we have as a, as a species experienced amazing advancement in our standards of life, right? Just like if you compare things pre-industrial revolution to how we are now, right, uh, just truly, truly astounding. But what we didn't do is we, we haven't quite, you know, we did that at the expense of a lot of natural resources, right? And we're now starting to pay the price for that, right? And paying the price for that means, in part, rising temperatures. Now, rising temperatures, you might say, okay, it's only a few degrees, but a few degrees here and there will, you know, can cause extinctions of some, you know, species, right, which are not particularly resilient. And you, you might say, well, okay, maybe I don't care about some random fish that's not very strong and, and die, or coral reefs, like maybe you don't like the corals. But then, right, the, even if you don't care about the specific thing, the downstream effects of that can be severe because the ecosystem, right, has evolved to, to operate in a way that is balanced and we are disturbing that balance faster than the ecosystem can adjust so i think that there are um you know the, the thing that i guess almost scares me even more than all the usual things are what are the things we're not thinking about because you know we have mathematical models for the climate we have mathematical models for the uh the ecosystem but it's so complicated that there are things, there, there are failure modes that are not in there. And there's, there's just going to be surprising, uh, surprising effects. I also am pretty optimistic about the ability of, you know, human beings to, to engineer solutions when things, uh, become dire. Okay. I, I think that this has been, yeah, go, please go ahead. Like Tesla, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I would want something better than Tesla. But I mean, okay. so, you know, the okay. idea that comes to mind is, look, we, um, you know, in the last century devised weapons that are able to exterminate us all. And well, maybe knock on wood and all, but we, you know, devised also a system of deterrence and and not using them right i mean the fact that it, it's actually kind of amazing to me that at the end of the day like nuclear weapons has only been detonated twice uh you know in a conflict right so that gives me a little bit of hope right that with the climate you know when when things get like when we're up against the wall of the reality of not just kind of up in an abstract sense of the temperatures will rise by 2050 but like when things start going really bad i'm optimistic that human beings are quick to come up with uh solutions and you know there are there are a lot of smart people out there right i mean i work at caltech and i'm every day impressed by the fact that there are a lot of smart people out there so that's what gives me hope uh, can, uh, I want to push back a bit to what you said before, out of curiosity. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's say in the ice age, yeah, in, in this in the Earth. So the ten 
temperature was so down, but the, still some stuff survived and maybe it helped this plant to be resilient or like uh, evolution unfolded in a different way. And so I am not sure if I can uh, un understand why some species, for example, the Ice Age killed the dinosaurs. So, uh, but uh, maybe a, a world without dinosaur is not less of a world or is not bad or good uh, in, in a sense. So I'm curious to hear what's your thoughts on this. No, I just I just don't want to end up as one of the species that goes uh, goes extinct. You know, I mean, you that's certainly there have been near mass extinctions or it was like mass extinctions before that that eliminated a lot of biodiversity. And you might say, well, this is just like the cycle uh, cycle of life. But in the case of the, um, you know, in the case of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs couldn't do anything about it, right? The asteroid was coming, and it's not like the dinosaurs were saying, "Well, like you know, with our tiny you know claws, let's set up a you know gravity deflection mission, let's figure this out." Right? They're, they had no I, no idea what was going on until uh, until the end, right? In our case, we're doing it to ourselves. It's within our power to to stop it and to change the course uh, here, and I think that it's. It's our responsibility to do that because it's not just us, right? It's also the rest of the earth that is uh, that hangs in, in the balance. Okay, F fair enough. <laughs> uh, before <laughs> we we move from space, I have uh, uh, a question uh, about how AI will influence. Uh, the world of space. It's all over the news. Uh, all over, AI, AI, AI is becoming a big part. So, how do you think it's influencing your life in research? Uh, how is influencing our ability to understand and explore space? Profoundly. Okay, I am uh, once again. I'm an AI optimist. Um, I have an AI startup that I co-founded with. Um, a colleague from Yale University, Greg Laughlin, as well as my wife, uh, and um, it's called Lucinetic. And I am very, very optimistic um, that AI will transform our lives in ways we haven't even yet began to imagine. Okay, there will be growing pains along the way. Okay, every new technology gets used both for good and for bad. Undeniably, there will be turbulence along the way, but I am optimistic that where we're headed eventually will be a good place. Let me give you uh, maybe just, you know, a couple brief examples. One is, is the use of, you know, artificial intelligence, of course, for, for text generation, right? Like that is all over the news all the time. And uh, that's something that accelerates every workflow, including the scientific one, right? That's just like a trivial thing. But I think going beyond that, artificial intelligence has a real chance of, um, of enabling new ways of doing science. Right? And what I mean here is that back, if you kind of dial the clock back 70 years ago, Right, 70 years ago, if you were a physicist, um, or, or not necessarily even a physicist, but it's just for definitive, and was a physicist, you could do theory by picking up a pen or a pencil, and then some paper, and you write stuff down, and you kind of, you know, try to solve things that way. Or you could go to the lab and do experiments, right? Those were the two primary ways that people used to do science. Now, with the emergence of computers, you could suddenly do experiments on your computer. And that's a lot of what I do is I design miracle simulations and design miracle experiments. And that is kind of a new way of cognition, right? Where you don't say, well, I can't figure it out on a piece of paper because the solution doesn't exist. And I can't make an experiment such as the solar system. You only have one. And so, but, you know, I'm stuck. Now you on the computer, you can simulate whatever you want. 
right? I think the art Be- that before, emerges. Before from, you uh-huh. continue go- going with the AI, can you explain me how do you simulate stuff on your computer? So you are there is a program. You are putting some basic law of physics, like there is gravity, there is this and that, and then you are ask let it run. Like how how yeah, does think- that look like? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you, you, you know, do whatever language you want, right? You choose your language, you write your uh, computer program in, with the laws of physics. Of course, this is where all of the art is because you cannot actually just program in everything. You can't just say here, the laws of physics simulate the world uh, because the computational power required to do that is is. Um, much too enormous, you have to be (laughs) uh, kind of careful and you have to be smart about the kind of model that you create for the problem that you are solving. Okay. And uh, and so you put in, that's kind of like ultimately what it comes down to is, is can you have the right imagination for, uh, for putting in just the right amount of physics to capture the effects you're talking about or, or the effects that are important, right? And still be able to solve it using a computer. And at the end of the day, right, you write the software or you take some software that somebody else has written, you modify it or whatever, and then you run it. And that run is like the experiment, right? So the numerical output from that becomes the output of, of the experiment. But of course, now for us human beings, we can only analyze things in kind of three, four dimensions max, right? It's hard for me to think in 16 dimensions or something. I don't know, maybe it's easy for you, but uh, for I have a hard time with that. But artificial intelligence is not fundamentally limited in this way, right? So it might be able to achieve scientific insights that we are limited we're kind of we don't have access to just from the because of the you know architecture of our brain right just like you know it's hard to explain because we have lack of imagination like you explained well yeah because our our brains have evolved to think in three spatial dimension at one terms. time. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And the, we, but, we, we are thinking, yeah. uh, we are drawing examples from our everyday life, but if it's something that we never experienced, we cannot like think about how it is. Exactly, exactly. So there, there's a lot of, um, you know, the situation is where, you know, there are things that are math, that work mathematically, but to visualize it is very hard. And so, like things that, operate in infinite dimensions, right? Like you can work through it mathematically, but it's hard to imagine what that's actually like. And so what if, you know, down the line, AI is able to uh, break through that barrier. It will be huge, right? It'll be like, you know, a new type of cognition. It, it will be all science happened in the last two or 400 years in a day and every day keep happening and maybe more well look yeah i mean it's it's a little scary of course because then you imagine then then you're kind of like you imagine yourself being in in a situation like kind of like a child where you know you've designed your your parent who says just relax the following will happen to you don't i can't explain why but once it happens, you will see that it's good, right? <laughs> you know, and it's sort of, that's a little scary, of course. But um, and, yeah, and sometimes I think, we don't have the right parents as well. And they are perception of <laughs> right and wrong is wrong. <laughs> that's, that's also true. That's also true. Right. But there's, I mean, at the end of the day, there's no reason to suspect that the human mind is some pinnacle of, of ultimate intellect in fact i have uh, i have i suspect it's quite the opposite right from yes, well, you know my be, having stupid been outside monkeys on a rock <laughs> <laughs> so right i mean i think it's going to be it's going to be a remarkable decade right right now it it has never 
occurred to me. Like I never imagined that the year, you know, 2023, right, was going to be the year that we're going to suddenly uh, kind of on a civilizational scale, right, get on board with a uh, kind of artificial intelligence really emerging. And I think, you know, I work a lot with large language models and it's it's a funny thing. It's an, an insight that, you know, my colleague Greg uh, Laughlin had is that this is our first contact with an alien species. And our first contact with an alien species was did not have to have, you know, some spacecraft and green, you know, like robots and kind of like gooey, you know, aliens, right? It's um, the ability to communicate with large language models that have, you know, have some some version of reasoning, right? They, they can reason to some extent for simple things, right? They can reason it out and it's different from how a human mind thinks, right? Like the fact that they're bad at arithmetic is really interesting uh, while being very good at kind of uh, other things. So, so yeah. That's my. What, that's my what is your what What is your startup uh, focusing on? I don't know if you can talk about. Uh, yeah, so we focus on. Uh, we kind of actually started out with specifically long form language modeling, right? So we focused on initially on kind of a lot of um, kind of career documents. So helping people write letters of recommendation, cover letters for jobs, you know, that, that kind of thing, things that are very, um, you know, that on the one hand have a structure to them, right? They're, these are not novels, right? These are kind of structured, uh, documents, but on the other hand need specificity and the ability to be your most expressive self is very important. And, um, you know, more recently we're, we're, we've pivoted to a much more, I think, interesting uh, set of problems which are which require much more kind of specific applications of artificial intelligence. And there, um, I can't talk too much about what we're doing quite yet, but um, there'll be a lot of stuff coming out in the next uh, so, you know, year so or so. So you're trying to develop a similar thing to ChatGPT, but with different... No, no. Uh, we we use. I mean, we'll, of course, large language models, including the OpenAI engines, are part of our backend. But we're not we're not trying to compete with OpenAI or you know Google's Bard or anything like that. Uh, it's more the application of things like that to specific problems. Okay, so okay, so you're trying to take all this generic thing and make it applicable to one thing, so you can start having immediate effect, so you can start having income and a business, and then grow from there, right? This is the basic that's, idea. That's that's one overview. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of it. So I am curious to to hear what is how. You are fucking young. You are a millennial. <laughs> so uh, how do you learn all this stuff in this short time? And how do well, you, you learn um, stuff? I don't know. I mean, I, I just, well, well, okay. So the, well, I guess the answer is um, I just do it. Like I, and not like I learn, but like I learn exclusively by doing stuff like take artificial I didn't know anything about AI until um, 2020 and then you know the pandemic began and I thought okay I have kind of new and kind of weird free time where I'm at home uh, and so I was like I'm gonna try and figure out some of this AI stuff and then I um, you know, kind of took some classes and I didn't actually like go to any classes. I just found some classes um, that were posted at various universities and tried to do some of the homework. And uh, then, you know, you just start playing around with it. You eventually get get to figuring stuff out. And this is the same thing, my, my approach also with science. I, I'm 
I've never really learned anything by like sitting down and trying to learn it because my brain doesn't absorb information that way very well. I just say, you know, okay, I'm going to, I know what problem I want to solve. And then I just try to play around with it. And then of course I fail 99% of the time, but that's okay. You know, you learn stuff along the way and that then, then I can actually uh, ingest that information. So it's just by trial and error. So basically the process that you describe is you have a problem that you want to solve and uh, you are excited and motivated to solve that problem and keep persisting uh, until you find some sort of solution or you you follow whatever that uh, river will take you. Yeah, I start off with simple, you know, simple examples that other people have done right i i really like to both like when i teach my classes at caltech and also when i try to learn stuff myself i i try to start with practical examples never from first understanding some big theory and then working it down but instead just something very simple and then kind of build upon it and then eventually you, you kind of start to see how things work a little bit better and uh, it's a continuous process, right? You never stop learning. And so, um, part of the joy of being a scientist is that, you know, as far as I can tell, I get paid to do exactly that, to stay curious and to continuously learn new things and sort of to keep up, right? To not just say, okay, I know one thing. And now I'm going to keep re-explaining that one thing back to everybody, right? But instead, kind of always challenging yourself, always changing, right? So you said some methods is watching university classes on a topic. Uh, are you reading books? Are you just finding the right person to ask the questions? More like, okay, I need to learn this. Give me some more examples that you're learning that in your life. I think, you know, going, just like going to a random university websites and finding their classes, right? Um, yeah, sometimes you watch the lectures, but most of the time, like, I don't frankly have patience for watching an hour long lecture about this and that. I just want to start doing stuff all the time. So I take the simplest problem that is posted and then I try to figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, then I go and I try to learn, watch, you know, some YouTube video or whatever, uh, or, or try to find it in a book, um, but always keeping the process going on actually trying to solve it. And the same uh, you do with music. This is hard because uh, it's very crazy. You're playing guitar, you're singing. This is the way that you approach everything in your life. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I write a lot of music by just like, you know, I pick up the guitar, I play, and I don't think to myself, okay, today I'm going to write a song that's going to be about this and that, right? It's just, it's nothing, you know, grandiose. It's just you play and occasionally, you know, you go, oh, well, like that was pretty interesting. And then you try to build on that. So I, I always, um, you know, when I travel for work, if it's for longer than a couple of days, I try to bring my guitar along and then I kind of play it, you know, also, you know, if I'm like spending time with my kids or, or you know, they're playing or whatever, I'm playing guitar. I'll always have my kind of iPhone with me so that I can, rec- if I find do something that's that's interesting and then I refine it, then I can quickly make a voice memo of it. So I have this bank of, I don't know, hundreds of little riffs here and there. It's also useful too because I, I, I listen to this sometimes when I run and I try to like think, on my run, okay, how am I going to put these things together? And then you discover that you sometimes rewrite the same song, right? Like you've written the same riff, you know, a month ago, and then you forget about it. And then a month later, you're like, wow, 
this is not not a bad riff. And then you record it again. It's as if it's a new thing. Uh, so, so I don't know. That's something I do. And also, I like writing music with uh, with other people. Like we, um, you know, my band currently, uh, we're going to be releasing a couple albums. You know, first one starting on June. 30th but the one we're working on right now is that, that you is wrote all, that you wrote you wrote the music for yeah yeah so all of the all of the music is all basically um myself for for music and, and lyrics uh but i'm starting to learn, work a lot more with the other guys in the band you know to of course during the pandemic It was difficult to write music together, but uh, but now we're doing a lot more collaboratively. So you have your band in real life? Of course, yeah. Yeah, we just played a uh, couple shows um, in May. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so we play live. We, you know, of course, we're all doing it, you know, in kind of a DIY fashion right uh, just trying to have a good time but also trying to make it actually kind of objectively good do the best we can so how uh, can you describe me your band like how is it a, a, a one guitar like is it a hundred guitars uh, is like how, it's, how your it's band two guitars <laughs> yeah so it's a hundred guitars <laughs> 600 basses Uh, zero vocals, okay? <laughs> It was like only one drum. <laughs> uh, It could. Yeah. Yeah. It's not... It's, It reminds... It's not, by the laws of, of physics, it's not... Uh, it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It hasn't... You know, it's not violating uh, any laws of physics laws. to have. Uh, um, yeah, look. So, it's a... Um, It's it's a couple guitars. It's me on the vocals on guitar. Uh, it's uh, it's a bass. It's a um, I got a few on the back. Uh, and uh, it's drums. It's you know like it reminds me of this one time when I was watching some video of Metallica before the show. And I think it was Lars who was complaining that all their songs are the same. And Jane's saying, well, of course they're the same. They they have two guitars, one bass, one drums, and one vocals. That's all they are. You know, so that's uh, that's more or less how we are too. A couple guitars, a bass, a drum set, some vocals, and, a lot of and, fun. And you are singing as well or they are, the others are singing as well? Uh, so I usually take over most of the lead vocals. Not all of it, but... But the vast majority, yeah. So how so many? The thing years, is, if you, uh, yeah, if uh, you play you guitar and this. sing, oh, I uh, you know with this band, of course, it has had many kind of uh, reincarnations. People but we started going in and out. That's right. That's right. We started in 2002 and put out our first album in 2003, and then we had another one in 2007, and Of course, after that, you know, life takes over and we had a lot of, um, you know, kind of trajectories and people moved here and there. Like I moved and lived in Boston for a while. And so there's that. But uh, we kind of really got back to work in 2015 and wrote new material, started playing live a lot more. And then, uh, you know, finally getting into the studio and recording all of this stuff ended up not being not just one but two new full albums and so i'm very very excited to be putting all of that out so can you explain me like the feeling of you playing music in front of an audience so i would say it's the time when it's the only time when i wonder if laws of physics can be violated right is when you're playing in front of the, uh, an audience because i feel like there's faster than speed of light communication that's going on right there are times when it's not just like the guys that are on the stage it's not just us playing right it's um it's like some kind of weird 
telepathy that occurs with the audience as well, where, where everybody's on the same frequency, everybody's on the same level, and everyone is kind of together. That's a really unusual right experience. It's just, it, it only, at least, you know, as far as I can tell, it's something that only happens when you're performing, you know, performing live with, with an audience. And, you know, in the studio, the, the experience is also quite remarkable because you can really try to engineer what you're, what you want your song to really sound like, right? You're not constrained by, oh, this is the one time we played it. And, you know, whatever notes came out is how they came out. It's the time when you can really, um, design the music that you want. So um, because you are very, um, uh, you read a lot of books, you think about logic and all these things. This is more like on the artistic side, right? This music thing is like, and uh, I'm I'm curious to understand what you think the value is of that in lives because there is, it seems that there is no value in a way yes, of it? of music like there is like is it like feeding your soul is it like getting people together is it like just creating nonsense for the sake of it like i'm curious to hear your thoughts on this yeah uh so what is the value of music more broadly right i think it's it's part of the human experience right like the human experience is absolutely the stuff that goes far beyond the practical, right? There's the practical, the things that we need to do to survive, all of the usual things. And then there's the, what we do kind of beyond that. And it's different for everybody, but for me, music has always been this thing that I really resonate with, right? I like, love listening to it. I love playing music. Um, and I guess I would push back and disagree that it's a different process from science. Uh, as for me, at least, it's exactly in the same ball. I mean, of course, I'm not like singing and playing guitar, you know, hoping to understand how the solar system works. But I'm the kind of process of having, you know, creativity, right, and the process of kind of taking these ideas seemingly out of nowhere and then developing them, that's identical in both cases. Right? The way you write music, it just kind of, I don't know, it appears from somewhere and then you, you go with it. Um, same thing with science, right? Scientific ideas, don't you can't command them to appear. They, they have to just kind of manifest. And then you go with it and you work through it just like you would work uh, with music. So what type of music do you make? Like it's like you reference Metallica, is it rock music? Yeah, it's, it's rock. It's rock in the kind of, you know, classic, you know, it's, well, we like just, you know, everybody in the band likes classic rock. Everybody in the band is a fan of Pink Floyd and the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Metallica and all this stuff. So it's, it's trying to, to capture some of that era rock and roll, but then do it in a modern way. So you are having, uh, as you can, are we able to listen to the music or is the album is not yet uh, out? So the new album comes out on uh, June 30th and we have set up a goal ourselves as a band of posting one piece of new material whether it's a new song or a music video once a week so starting with june 30th we're going to be posting you know once a week for a very very long time uh we began by revisiting uh one of our old songs from the 2007 album and just kind of doing a uh, posting a couple acoustic versions of it that we recorded during the pandemic. One of them is actually uh, this thing we did for kind of a live performance that was at a um, separated by six meters or whatever we were 
<laughs> you know what I'm trying to do at the time. Uh, so it was a pandemic kind of era thing. And um, yeah, we're going to be, it's going to be a, a crazy ride. So because of uh, the, the, this interview will be released after uh, June oh, uh, 30. So we have now the link on the description, the first album. So you guys Perfect. can go and see what this crazy astrophysicist is <laughs> doing in music and judge him and drop some comments uh, below if you like it or if you are a fan of rock. Uh, I told you as well that Damn. I'm going to put it on, on my Instagram and saying here and a story for people to go and check the music because uh, uh, music is, like you said, is for me, I, I hear music and I see that it's, I have it like, it's so, it's like eating food. It's like sometimes okay. when I go, I go, for example, I was seven days on a coffin underground. And the only thing that I missed underground, it was music, uh -huh. honestly. So because, uh, and sometimes I go without technology for seven days and I'm locked in a room. And the only thing that I miss is music. So it's so profound on the human experience. So I, I love it. <laughs> I love wow, music. Wow. <laughs> I mean, look, yeah. Uh, it would be a bummer to be in a coffin without, without a record player. <laughs> so, I don't know what so, you were thinking. <laughs> so uh, I think... Uh, this uh, this interview was uh, one. Uh, I started think I was so it it was five a.m. that uh, I woke up uh, uh, here in Los Angeles that I, I live and I was so what? excited to learn ab about astrophysics because there is I think there is so much potential to have actually apply in stuff with artificial intelligence now and have rapid. Uh, growth on these factors so we can really understand and do so many uh, cool things and maybe do uh, so i think this is one of the most relevant topics to involve ai with because the it yes is and i'm i i'm very 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 excited about this uh, topic about space because like I, I when Elon Musk was saying it, uh, that is the greatest adventure to think about space, to talk about space, the, or to live from planet Earth and go to space. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really pay attention, but with these conversations, I really understand the beauty of this. So uh, I, I love you. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being so open to my uh, all this time that we spent together and to my stupid questions and you dm my oh. mate fan of me <laughs> it is thanks for the conversation it was so much fun i love you guys thank you for watching go and check his album in the link in the description bye bye